would love to welcome uh, our next moderator, uh, Ingrid Srinath, who is the director for Center for Social Impact and Philanthropy, uh, to moderate the discussion on sharing India's development agenda between arguably the three most important stakeholders, uh, which is the Samaj, Sarkar, and Bazaar. And we couldn't have asked for a better stellar panel today uh, uh, to talk about this and guide us through the sort of discussion. Uh, over to you, Ingrid. Thank you, Sri Ram, um, and welcome all. Happy Independence Day. Um, there are many words that have sort of gained currency during this crisis. Uh, unprecedented, flattening the curve, a case fatality rate, all kinds of technical jargon. But the word I think that most exemplifies it is the word epiphany. It means a moment of great or sudden revelation. And the, 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 the crisis has opened so many new vistas to us. Uh, we've suddenly, it seems, become aware of the reality of the lives of hundreds of millions of our fellow citizens. We've suddenly had made visible to us the state of our public health system, the precarious conditions under which most Indians labor and live, and the great chasms of inequality that permit us to remain blind to these realities. But we've also had revealed the unstinting compassion of the people we so often refer to as ordinary, especially those at the front lines of healthcare, sanitation, transportation, and so many other fields. We've seen also the incredible willingness of business people, performers, chefs, artists, comedians, journalists, students, bureaucrats, and homemakers to transcend their immediate self-interest and respond in every way that they can. Particularly evident has been the courage and commitment of hundreds of thousands of NGOs and community-based organizations, which whether they had the resources or not, whether it was their mission or not, at the cost of the safety of their staff, many of whom have taken voluntary salary cuts and could in fact find themselves unemployed in a few weeks or months. Many of us also suddenly had our perceptions of each other altered business people, philanthropists, bureaucrats, civil society, suddenly found ourselves in new forms of partnership with a new appreciation for each other's value and a real realization of the value of collaboration. The scale and intensity of this disruption to every aspect of our lives has also accelerated the pace of change in the adoption of technology, for instance, and made possible some radical reimagination of deeply entrenched systems, education, healthcare, housing, social protection, gender roles, inclusion, the climate crisis, and many more. Policies like portability of entitlements or universal basic income, the idea of internet connectivity as a human right. Many of these policies that have been sort of lurking in the darker corners of the corridors of power are suddenly in the limelight. But as in every crisis, there are also regressive pulls away from hard-won protections for labor and for the environment. Each day we read of more workers trickling back to the cities which they escaped from not so long ago returning to the very conditions that reduce them to desperately take to the highways and railway tracks. And at a time of really widespread tragedy, I think the stories of children killing themselves because they don't have the means to access online schooling are probably more heartbreaking than most. As we mark today the anniversary of our independence from colonial rule, we still find colonial era laws being used to stifle dissent and lockdowns, both offline and online, constraining our freedoms of expression, assembly, and association. Over and above all these, because of the severe impact on all fronts of development, we could be staring at backsliding and losing years of progress made on the SDGs, making the need to work together and to imagine new ways of working together all the more imperative. Our panelists for this session have each had a unique perspective on these developments. They have been simultaneously at the forefront of the response by government, business, and civil society, and at the same time at the center of networks, partnerships, alliances, and convenings within these segments and between Sarkar, Bazaar, and Samaj. Very few people, I imagine, can combine their view of the big panoramic picture that they have with the one you can only get from direct hands-on experience. I'll try, 
introduce doing justice to introducing them would take the rest of this session. So I'm going to quickly sort of give you their highlights. Amitabh Khan, who scarcely needs any introduction, is CEO of the National Institute for, Institution for Transforming India, or Niti Aayog. He's an IAS officer of the 1980 batch Kerala Kada and the author of Branding India, an incredible story. He's been a key driver of the Make in India, Startup India, Incredible India, and God's Own Country initiatives that have positioned India and Kerala as leading manufacturing and tourism de destinations. His work across tourism, infrastructure development, product enhancement, private public partnership has been widely recognized. And he also drove as Secretary Industries, the Ease of Doing Business in Initiative and the Ranking of States. He's the Chairman of the Committee to Implement Digital Payment in India and the recipient of too many awards and recognitions for me to list here. Vani Kola is the Managing Director at Kalari Capital, an early stage venture capital firm based in Bangalore. She's a renowned investor and is known for her vision in identifying emerging markets. Uh, her leadership at Kalari centers around her commitment to the development of entrepreneurs and her conviction that Indian companies are poised to become global players. She's a technology focused investor with many of her investments validating her aptitude for picking the best young minds and mentoring them into building high growth enterprises. Um, then again, I could literally go on and on, but the thing that struck me about uh, Vani CV was the fact that she believes in sustainable living and actually grows enough organic produce in her own garden to meet her family's needs. Finally, Amitabh Behar, who's the CEO of Oxfam India, passionate about governance, accountability, social and economic equality, and citizen participation. Over the decades, he's worked in building many people-centric campaigns and alliances for social justice and linking microactivism to macro changes. He's one of the leading experts of people-centered activity advocacy and chairs the board of Nafsarjan. He's also the vice board chair at Civicus where I used to work and sits on many other boards. I'm gonna dive straight in in the interests of, uh, of time. And I'm gonna start with you Amitabh Gant. My first question really, as I said, we've seen how this pandemic has made starkly visible some of the inequities of many of our systems. Niti Aayog, as I said, has been at the center of convening multiple collaborations during the pandemic. You have had startups, philanthropy, nonprofits, business, government, across ministries on a variety of themes. How do you see us building on that experience and those relationships to really reimagine our approach to some of these urgent policy issues? Uh, so, Ingrid, first, uh, you know, I work in... Uh, the 112 of the most uh, backward districts of India. We don't call them backward. We call them the aspirational districts of India. And we work across a range of areas uh, from education, health, nutrition, skills, agriculture. Uh, and in all these uh, districts, we've seen a tremendous spirit of the people of India. You know, uh, from, uh, uh, you know, if you look at it from each district, uh, just look at uh, a district like Noom, where uh, they carried out radio-based awareness to community counselation in uh, uh, Pakur to a whole range of unique initiatives in each one of these districts. But one of the key things we did during this crisis was to really uh, mobilize uh, all the civil society organizations. We run a NGO Darpan in uh, Niti Ayo, and uh, where we have over uh, 92,000 NGOs who are registered with us. And one of the things we did was that we built up a very active and a very efficient partnership with these uh, 92,000 NGOs who supplemented the government efforts to provide uh, shelter to homeless, to daily wage workers, uh, to urban low-income families, and they provided food. And uh, they came really forward with very focused campaigns towards uh, elderly care and practicing COVID-safe behavior. We separately run another program uh, called Dada Dadi and Nana Nani campaign to protect the elderly. And we do this with uh, Piramal Trust and that is the Piramal Foundation. And they, th that has really made a huge impact. Uh, but what it really shows is that uh, the crisis has shown us that when uh, the community, 
that's the samaj the bazaar and the sarkar all come together uh, we are able to create a force that is true much stronger than the sum of its parts and this partnership is required and in many ways uh, a collaborative very collaborative and an inclusive partnership is required with all players uh, we will continue to focus on you know across each one of these programs that we've run Uh, during the covid the other thing that we've done is we very closely worked with a number of startups and our my our belief is uh, that technology will be one of the key drivers of india's growth in the days to come and how we use technology to leapfrog in many of these areas so we partnered uh, about a whole range of startups and a whole range of uh, uh, you know uh, 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 young entrepreneurs to create Uh, platforms unique platforms which will drive uh, india's future in terms of education in health in terms of providing credit uh, using the direct benefit transfer and how we can make uh, direct benefit transfer far more effective so we worked around seven eight uh, different uh, products uh, technology products and you'll see the results of these in the coming days uh, but uh, our belief is uh, as we go along that community will play a very critical role uh, civil society organizations will play a very critical role and the important thing is during this period because uh, in many areas while we do this education is getting impacted health is getting impacted uh, because of covid and therefore uh, while we uh, you know and we should not end up creating more inequities in society and therefore it's very important uh, because there is a digital divide as well and therefore one has to be very conscious about these issues that when uh, the government when the prime minister talks about uh, sabka saath sabka vikas and sabka vishwas it's very necessary that we take everybody along and win everyone's trust and that we build up and this is really uh, resonates with the core sdg principle of leaving no one behind and therefore building up collaborative cohesive and inclusive partnerships across mm -hmm. uh across all sections of the society is very critical and truly focus on education health and nutrition that is to my mind really the key if we are able to really focus on these three areas we'll stand india in good stead in the long run because the crisis will hit poor communities on education health and nutrition in a very big way thank you amitabh uh vani moving to you uh, amitab just mentioned uh, the role that startups are playing and you've been at the center of a couple of new coalitions of startups in and in the area of health um the, overall though the business community's response has been quite spectacular from immediate medical supplies and protective equipment all the way through to contributions to the pm cares fund we've seen the corporate sector stepping up uh, on all fronts how do we sustain this how do we build on this momentum we you attracted people to think about health policy for example who had no interest in this topic 5 months ago people have deeply engaged on issues of how to make tech, bring technology to solve some of these problems in ways that they never could have imagined 6 months ago how do we sustain that momentum vani and and uh leverage all of this commitment these resources to build back better and go beyond addressing the symptoms to actually addressing some of the root causes of these problems thank you um ingrid it's uh, great to have an opportunity to share on these topics and this panel itself is um, indicative of how uh, we are all coming together the world um in its uh, context but each of us through collaboration for hopefully long term good and you know i think sometimes a crisis has the capacity to bring out the best in us um almost i think everyone have in the last few months felt a calling for a kind of purpose and doing something more for the well being of all right so while all of us have done that individually we could do more when we come together as a community and i think this corona crisis and the response by government bodies and private enterprises alike has been uh, for me personally very heartening and learning uh, process um like you mentioned it has brought together organizations who normally haven't worked together normally don't 
uh, really know each other and they've been able to put up coordinated efforts, all virtually in most instances, to help um, do what they can. Uh, a good example I'd like to take you know, would be what came together impromptu, something I've been involved in called ACT Grants Initiative that started as a Saturday morning conversation among a few people that I was part of. And uh, I feel that I and my firm Kalari have been very lucky and privileged in fact, to be part of it because we have learned uh, so much and uh, it has given us an opportunity to do more than sort of the narrow framework of what uh, we were working on. Uh, come together as a consortium of leaders from the Indian startup community comprising of VCs, uh, startups, foundations, government bodies, including Nitya Ayog and uh, 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 Amitabh sir and you know others. Um, the idea was to provide grants to startups who can combat uh, COVID. And the other thing it has allowed is for us to work directly with many state governments. I mean, Telangana, Gujarat, uh, Karnataka, Kerala, Haryana, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, many. It's not an experience the startups or the VCs have had in the past. And in uh, doing this right. by bringing capital and uh, resources to accelerate solutions. So I think this is a good example. And another example in the health uh, that you brought up is uh, an initiative that was founded out of ACT, uh, which is called SWAST, with a broader cause of uh, addressing root cause challenges in healthcare accessibility and affordability. Uh, and again, it came as a collaborative effort and a nonprofit effort from um, almost many of the startup founders and the medical fraternity, which also generally don't interact as much. And obviously, um, grants from ACT and uh, foundations and so forth. Um, the aim is to uh, take India's proven clinical capabilities and our demonstrated technology prowess, which have kind of haven't sat side by side, but to bring them to bridge the healthcare needs at large and to do that beyond the crisis itself. I mean, the crisis has come and the crisis will go. Um, it still leaves behind a lot of problems for us to uh, solve. And so, you know, to democratize access of quality primary care for um, every citizen anyway. And of course, to do that in a way that the access is affordable and, uh, we, and it's not possible to do that without leveraging digital uh, technology, which is really where the startup ecosystem can contribute its um, knowledge and uh, uh, resources. And, uh, you know, to involve the government uh, in that process on how do you build, uh, uh, you know, national health standards and uh, really ensure interoperability. So such collaborations, I think, in various capacities have intensified. Uh, across the country, across various groups. And uh, uh, from our experience, the, uh, you know, a pleasant experience has been how much the central and state governments are willing to work um, uh, on, on these initiatives to build a better India. So, you know, if there is anything good we can take away from this crisis, it is this, uh, creating awareness and platforms to do better for uh, the future. And I think the startup community with its, you know, fervor for entrepreneurship can contribute to the higher cause of solving for larger challenges, not just leading with heart, but with innovation. So, you know, what has happened in the technology ecosystem typically was that it didn't really have any deep linkages outside of its own community and ecosystem. And today those have been formed with the uh, uh, you know, governments, nonprofits, and so on and so forth. And so I think in this effective mutual engagement of Samaj Sarkar Bazaar, which is a great way have you put it, one of the good things as uh, Amidab Kansar said is we need this cohesive force and not be silos. And uh, so I think I've seen these partnerships come together and be uh, more effective. So uh, I think that's the beginning for us to take each challenge and uh, come together to uh, solve them. Nothing is insolvable when all of us collectively put our heart and our mind to it. Thank you, Vani. Um, coming to you, Amita, be hard now. I have never had the pleasure of moderating a panel with two Amitas before. Uh, but, uh, you know, one of the, the, the 
silver linings, if you will, of this crisis has been the newfound appreciation of the role that civil society plays, not just in a crisis, but in an ongoing manner. Uh, at the same time, you more than others would be aware of the constraints under which civil society operates, what's often referred to as the closing space for civil society. How can government, business, civil society work together to really empower civil society, these grassroots communities that Amitabh Kant is talking about, to ensure their voices reach the people that and make the policy, that decide the philanthropy, that decide the development programs uh, that we're talking about. And not just that, not just that last mile service delivery role that everyone has lauded, but the role that civil society plays really to maintain a healthy democracy. So thank you, Ingrid, and, and thank you, Naj, for uh, starting this conversation. And let me just use the word unprecedented, not to say that the crisis was unprecedented, but to say that the coming together and the public spirited response that we saw was absolutely unprecedented. So the coming together of, of uh, citizen action groups to not-for-profits to uh, uh, philanthropies, corporates, and the government has been quite remarkable. And, and given the, the, the size of the uh, problem, I think we've been able to tackle it at least partially because of this coming together. Uh, but but let me you know just try and zoom out a little uh, at this moment because today is Independence Day, and we have done a lot of conversations around COVID. So you know let's let's just zoom out a little and let's look at a a, a longer conversation. And I want to you know I'm I'm really happy that you use the phrase health of democracy. Because that's a conversation from where I want to build. Glad that you recognize it. And I, I want to use, you know, that's one frame with which I want to respond. Let me just bring in very quickly another frame. And that is, if you go back to the Millennium Declaration, I've worked a lot on MDGs and SDGs. The Millennium Declaration actually said what we need is freedom from fear and freedom from want. So if, if you merge these two, health of a, a democracy, and freedom from fear and freedom from want. In that context, I want to look at India and I want to look at civil society's role in that architecture of democracy. So, so let me just say, you know, there, there are four kinds of roles that I particularly want to emphasize. And, and, you know, I'm just flipping the question back to you in terms of what we need is recognition of these roles. Uh, the first one, which is often recognized and celebrated, particularly during COVID, it is being celebrated, is the service delivery function. And I, I think we've done a wonderful job. Even I, as uh, Oxfam, in a small way, we contributed to feeding more than three lakh uh, people and so on. But that's, that's a role that's recognized and respected. But I do think that the second, which is very, very critical, and that's where the bulk of our conversation should be, is holding power to account. And I don't think that we have done adequate work. I would actually say that we have failed in not holding government to account uh, in this crisis where uh, the pandemic was seen as a law and order crisis initially. Or when we started seeing the migration happening, the government not being able to facilitate the travel. As in lakhs and lakhs of people, the tragic uh, scenes that we have seen, how could we have helped that? So that's the second function which needs recognition. And I'll just come back to what could be done. And the third, I think, is critical, is, is actually nurturing new ideas. So it, it's about dreaming. If, if you really look at new ideas of change, they very often come from civil society. So whether it's joint forest management or the barefoot doctors, as, and you can just go on, uh, the ideas of change have primarily come not from the centers, they've obviously come from the, the, the margins and in terms of the civil society. And the fourth, and I'm very happy that uh, Mr. Khan specifically talked about it, is whether you call it the Gandhi's talisman or putting the last first, or as the UN is now saying, leave no one behind. Because in whatever uh, architecture of democracy you create, the last voice, the most, the meekest voice will be left out. And in all this, I think, I feel worried that the focus is becoming more and more on the service delivery, both by the state, and I would even say that the businesses, the philanthropies are now recognizing it. It's important in a country where we have such levels of, of uh, poverty even now, I think it's important to do the service delivery role. 
But the question is, can we use the civil society's role? Uh, you know, just let me give you one example. The, the budget for NREJ is 35 to 40,000 crores, more or less. The total budget that comes to civil society, 10,000 to 15,000 of CSR, 15,000 of, of FCRA and so on. So it's actually less than just the allocation for NREJ. How can we use our resources, our, our uh, capacities to actually see it as a golden peanut? which makes all the money of the government accountable and ensures that it's delivering justice. It ensures that it is doing exactly what Mr. Kant is saying, uh, uh, not creating inequality, but creating a far more equal society. So, so those are really the, the questions and there are multiple ways of doing it. Uh, as in corporates can just ensure that they're not doing any harm. They're working so much on responsible business. I think that's the, the right track we need to work on. Government can create a nurturing environment. People who are asking questions need to be actually uh, nurtured and, and further encouraged to ask more questions because that's how you can probably uh, improve. And, and uh, uh, I, I think that then this coming together with this broad understanding of, of the democratic architecture will deliver the change uh, that we're looking at. Thank you. We're looking not just at building networks, but really shifting some norms of how we see each other and how we interact with each other. Coming back to you, Amitabh Kant, you have, I think, in print and in, in person, um, hugely been recognizing the role of that civil society has played even today. Uh, you made mention of it several times. Uh, given your background in, in developing the ease of doing business, um, paradigm, if you will. How can we work together to make ease of doing good or give as much priority to ease of doing good as we have to ease of doing business? So, you know, first of all, I think it's very important uh, that uh, to understand that we, at least uh, Niti Aayog and government works with a vast number of NGOs, not only the 92,000 which are registered with us, but in the whole range of programs that we do. Uh, you know, the aspirational district program, uh, the, uh, you know, the SDG goals, et cetera. I work personally with a huge range of NGOs at the grassroots level. And my experience with them has been extremely satisfying. You know, the civil society organization is extremely satisfying. In fact, uh, the villages where a major transformation has been done has uh, been those where the district collectors have been able to partner the NGOs very effectively. So I'm a strong believer and I've worked for many years in, uh, the, with the fishermen community in Kerala where I used the strength of the NGOs to form their self-help groups and provide new technology to them in terms of, uh, you know, and uh, get them a higher return for their catch. So I'm a great believer in personally working with NGOs across the board. Uh, we, you know, in... We register all NGOs through the NGO Darpan and anybody who's registered actually uh, with the, uh, in the NGO Darpan, we'll be very happy to work in partnership and all government departments actually, uh, these are NGOs with whom all government departments work. So uh, our belief is that we should make things extremely easy and simple. That is what I've tried to do in uh, ease of doing business as well. We've scrapped over 1400 laws. We've digitized across the government. Uh, we've uh, made things easy and simple. We should keep scrapping procedures as we go along. This applies not merely to businesses and the private sector. The more India becomes easy and simple, and that's been the Prime Minister's whole focus on making India easy and simple. Uh, India will take a quantum jump in terms of uh, providing a better livelihood for its citizens. Uh, but I think one of the key things has been that the uh, this year's budget, the fin finance minister had announced a fairly bold vision of having a social stock exchange, which uh, envisages, uh, you know, it envisions to serve as a platform for fundraising and structural measures to measure the impact of social reforms. And uh, to my mind, this, is, this announcement is a very significant step towards ease of doing uh, business because reforms require uh, thinking, uh, forming, norming, and the social stock exchange is actually will be the beginning of the thinking process. And uh, we can then focus on forming great partnerships. 
uh, but uh, today we already have, uh, you know, in great measure in several government programs, uh, great examples of working with both private and social sector. Our focus should be to make these examples a norm. Uh, the more we talk about good practices, you know, each one of these aspirational districts has one civil society or the other organization working and delivering and transforming these districts in a whole range of indicators and outcomes. And we need to highlight these. Our focus should be to make these examples very, very visual and market these actually, because these partnerships will be then normalized and when we have fewer barriers on the policy side, because people in government will then realize that actually civil society organization has been a very major facilitator and catalyst in transforming. Uh, and we should uh, actually use them to bring a lot of innovation. You know, government has certain strengths. Uh, it has certain strengths of bringing size and scale. Uh, it is good at harder elements, but it's, it's on the softer elements, you know, the extension, the mass communication, the forming of communities, all that requires a civil society approach. And therefore, I'm a believer that uh, uh, you know some of the work that the N Nudge Foundation uh, is doing to build a new breed of social entrepreneurs will be extremely uh, helpful to the government. Uh, we must all realize that the COVID crisis has asked all of us to work, uh, you know, in partnership with each other. Uh, we've demonstrated this in the manufacturing of PPE, in the manufacturing of N95 masks, in manufacturing of ventilators, all this. And we need to take this innovation, skills and technology to meet our social development goals as well. And uh, our, our belief is that we need to come together to build the social enterprises structure for continued sustainable development of India. That alone will make us achieve our SDG goals within the defined time frame, uh, because we have to be innovative in our approach. We need to bring greater transparency and technology, which is what we are constantly doing in social development. And we must show impactful results on the ground. And that will ensure better ease of living. And that is what is important. It's not ease of doing business, but it's about ease of living for the citizens of India and only a good partnership effort with all sections of society, particularly the private and the community will really provide a better livelihood. Uh, so COVID, while lives are important, uh, improving the livelihoods of citizens would require this collaborative partnership. So let me push back just a little bit on that, which is, th that's extremely encouraging to hear as a statement of a vision. Does Niti Ayok see for itself a role in actually ensuring that this dialogue, this collaboration continues in some institutionalized, structured way? Yeah, so we don't Ingrid, lose the momentum that we've gained. Yeah, Ingrid, you're not aware, but yesterday we had uh, uh, almost a three and a half hour meeting with CSO organizations. We, we have 17 different groups of CSOs who are advising us on different areas uh, from health to nutrition, to agriculture, to skill, to technology, a whole range of them uh, from the grassroots level are all involved on a regular basis and work with us. Thank you. Vani, coming back to you for a minute, uh, this whole, uh, you mentioned this really, which is why we've seen how the, the crisis has sort of accelerated the acceptance of technology, almost forced the adoption of technology across sectors. I can tell you in the NGO world, we did a study at CSIP and one of the key findings was NGOs waking up and saying, oh my God, we should have done this a long time ago. We've really left it too late uh, to adopt technology. My question really is, yes, we're seeing all of that momentum and the flip, side, but the flip side of that is this exacerbating inequality that all of you have spoken about, really. How can we ensure that we use technology to enhance equity, enhance inclusion? I saw a question on the chat about uh, disabled people. How do we ensure that technology reduces inequality rather than exacerbates it? Ingrid, you're right. This uh, situation has definitely accelerated tech adoption. Did we lose Vani? Vani, can you hear us? Yes, I can hear you. Can you not hear me? You froze for a minute there. Carry on. Oh, so sorry about that. 
I was just saying that this has accelerated tech adoption across every sector and every segment of society, creating massive shifts in consumer habits. But sadly, things like work from home, study from home are a challenge for many people, a large group of people outside the tech industry. And you know, there are many segments. I have been in several conversations that say, is this a boon or a bane for women to work from home, you know, and it could be both. Um, and obviously industries that require employees in physical places, uh, you know, loneliness for the old or the young. And I think there was, we talked earlier on job loss and financial stress. So I think while there is acceleration, there's no doubt there are lots of problems that technology has also brought. But, you know, with the, um, say, access to smartphones and what is happening uh, of adoption across Indian demographic, long term, I do think that there's a power shift to the consumer, which I think is a good thing in terms of just thinking about what are some of the good things, what are some of the challenges. And in fact, I saw a report from Oxfam that talked about India's top 10% of the population holds 74% of the total national wealth. And, um, uh, you know, so how, but the, hence there is a great responsibility on how do, we, how do we create a society that shares and holds it, itself intrinsically to social responsibilities. And that can't be all done through taxation and tax policies. It has to come from a deep sense of, you know, uh, 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 civic uh, responsibility. So while the entire digital story, say for example, dig digitization of cash, uh, I think whether that's bank accounts, UPI, wallet, the pace at which it's growing, I think it's good because it mainstreams access and inclusion and hopefully provides more revenue to government to deploy across all of this. Uh, but the widened gap, the persistent inequality and the negative implication for, you know, the uh, uh, creates, I, I believe, a fundamental macroeconomic uh, instability if we don't find inclusive economic growth mechanisms, right? So, you know, while we know digital literacy is the need of the hour, uh, we don't have the basic infrastructure for uh, many. Uh, the problem is not how technology can solve the a need of digital literacy. That's actually an easy answer. Uh, how do you solve access and affordability is the bigger problem. And that can't be a fully private initiative, right? So those are really the cross linkages. Uh, so it's not a, if we looked at it purely from a technology answer, it's not going to come up with the solutions, okay? So I, I think venture capital plays a very important role in um, innovation of any ecosystem. And government plays a very important role in creating access at a policy level to all of its citizens. So those two need to uh, you know, come together. So the policymakers and fostering of innovation has to be integral to the culture of risk-taking and you know, entrepreneurship. So, you know, how do we empower people to become part of the movement, you know, require that from a peer, uh, uh, how should I say, um, uh, you know, expectation. So I think the open question uh, is, while we cannot, we will not be, we will not be able to turn the class clock back on digitization, and that's a good thing. How do we make sure we don't create paucity of um, talent, how do we upskill uh, people uh, better to be able to leverage all of this? How do we have a policy of leave no one uh, behind? So, like I said, I think while majority of today's startups, which is the world I live in, definitely understand the you know, process of innovation, um, they have to overhaul the culture of the organization with the uh, realization that, you know, uh, there is a uh, there is a uh, value for uh, pro including their uh, innovation to have inclusivity and equitability, and that somehow has a reward. Perhaps 
you can't provide a financial reward, but we are not all dictated by financial rewards. How do we create other rewards that bring these, you know, innovation, inclusivity, and equitability um, together? So whether it's technology, finance, you know, education, you know, healthcare, uh, uh, skills development, I am what I'm motivated by because I uh, am born an optimist, which is why I do this job, and you know, I want to look at positivity and gratitude every day, which is how my rituals of the day are constructed um, in the morning. Uh, I, I really think there is a silver lining. Uh, as I said uh, earlier, for the first time, we are creating cohesive conversations and collaborative engagements and teams. Um, and if we execute this thoughtfully, I think technology um, I'm also an engineer, so you know what else can I say? Will transform has the possibility of transforming, you know, uh, India to be the sort of 21st century superpower, if you will, you know. And I think maybe we use this crisis to, uh, you know, lift uh, more people from uh, uh, poverty into inclusion and uh, middle class, and you know, create the stimulus for economic growth that we, you know, require. So. You, to answer your question, what I feel, uh, Ingrid, is uh, as much as there's a shift of culture uh, that technology companies need to make, there is also a shift in culture from policy and government on how do you make this possible. Um, and uh, there's learning on both sides to do that. That's what I have taken away in the last uh, six months. And we need more diverse voices in the boardroom. Uh, I mean, the corporate sector has been hopelessly dragging its feet on uh, diversity in governance. Uh, maybe this is an opportunity for not just women, but for all other forms of, of diversity to push for greater inclusion uh, when it comes to corporate governance. And maybe the government can play a role uh, in nudging uh, that process forward. Um, Amitla, I mean, I'm sure you're heartened by the fact that, you know, regardless of sector, everyone has sort of rallied behind the leave no one behind mantra. Everyone, I think, is looking, Amitab Khan talked about the 17 new uh, subgroups uh, at Niti Aayog uh, that will work on these uh, various issues. At the same time as these windows are opening, civil society find it, finds itself staring at the bleakest funding scenario of my living memory. Uh, our data suggests that we could be looking at 2 million job losses in the sector, that we could be looking at a 50% drop in CSR funding. As you mentioned, in any case, the totality of private funding for, C for civil society is less than the revenue of Maruti Suzuki. So in this, in this perfect storm, if you will, of the greatest surge in demand for our services, at the same time as the greatest constraints in the resources available to us, how can civil society organizations adapt or survive really um, to take advantage of all of these openings and opportunities? Thank you, Ingrid, but let me just start by echoing your demand for greater diversity in the corporate boards. Thank you for raising that. And thank you, Waniji, for referencing our Oxfam inequality report. Uh, you know what, what you're saying is uh, a crisis that we are probably we've not even thought of. We've not imagined how to deal with it. So as you're saying, uh, two million job losses, uh, probably thirty to fifty percent cuts in CSR. Uh, there's no new money coming in from international donors. Private philanthropies with the markets not doing well are also going to go down. And, and we work with even retail individual givers, and that's also going to clearly see a decline. So this is going to be an absolutely unprecedented time uh, for the civil society in terms of funding. And, and we need to fundamentally relook at multiple things. Uh, so, so let me just say a few things again. One fundamental point, and I really hope we all talk about it, COVID, us, COVID is probably at least giving us an opportunity or it's nudging us to completely reboot how we function. 
the reboot the economy, reboot governance, reboot how development happens, so that you can create a far more just, humane, sustainable future. And, and that's a longer conversation, but if, if we are able to make some fundamental changes in the developmental trajectory, in the way governance is done, hopefully civil society will also be able to address some of these questions, but that's, that's a fairly conceptual response to what you're saying. Let me be very specific. Uh, what I would say is uh, we do need support of multiple kinds. It's, it's very good to hear about the 17 uh, working groups that Niti Aayog has, has uh, constituted. And what I would say is we need a solid support uh, from the government, both in terms of recognizing the role, but also financially supporting. As Mr. Khan said, if there are certain functions which civil society performs better, I think how do you even resource those functions, which could be the last mile communication, uh, social mobilization and so on. So that's one. Uh, in that, I think it would be really helpful to also look at the ease of business. So we did talk about the social stock exchange, but let me also say that the same budget also brings in fairly difficult provisions for the uh, civil society sector. As civil society, we need to go and renew our charitable status every five years now. Uh, though it's been deferred at the moment, but that's what it's going to do now. While we are reporting to income tax, reporting to the charities commissioner, reporting to the home ministry and so on, and still we need to do all that. So in this difficult time, how do you uh, at least change and create a uh, greater ease of, of, of uh, business, so to speak? From the donors, philanthropists, businesses, I would say, yes, COVID is massive, but to start completely diverting all resources uh, to only COVID responses is going to create difficulties, not just for civil society, but the society at large. As in, who will continue working on the LGBT exclusion or Dalit discrimination or just the question of, of how uh, Adivasis can learn in their mother tongues? So there, there are a whole range of issues which are getting further staffed because the resources are moving to, uh, to, to COVID. Uh, the donors, businesses can actually start giving unconditional support, even if it's reduced. This is the time, I think, working in collaboration in true partnership, not for projects, but partnership of institutions will have a dramatically uh, different impact. And just two, three thoughts on civil society itself, because I do think that the onus is with civil society. Uh, the first is, I would say that we do need a, a much broader rainbow coalition now of civil society groups, of advocacy groups, research groups, innovators, if we really want to deliver the change we are looking at. We cannot work in our silos that I do livelihood and you do education and we don't engage. Social problems are far more integrated and we need to really try and uh, build synergies to resolve uh, uh, that. The second is we do need an ecosystem uh, which strengthens the work that we are doing whether it's again as a research entity or whether it's an advocacy group, but the ecosystem which helps us actually complement each other and amplify uh, the work we are doing. Uh, the third I wanted to say is we do need a strong union of civil society. I think it's, it's critical. You have a CII, you have a FICI, we do have our own uh, bodies, but they, they do not have the adequate, uh, either the bandwidth or the voice that's needed. So coming together uh, of, of union of civil society is gonna be really, really central. And finally, uh, uh, I do think that there are some normative questions to be asked of the civil society. How much do we get professionalized? What's the salary structure in, in, in civil society and so on? Can we look at the voluntary sector and this is a new name, we've started calling it the not-for-profit sector, civil society. It is the voluntary spirit, the volunteerism that needs to be brought in. And maybe that will help us try and address some of these funding uh, questions. Thank you. Thank you, Amitabh. Um, Amitabh Khan, do you want to respond at all to Amitabh Bihar's uh, request that government do more, not just in terms of convening and recognition, but also perhaps looking at financial support in the way that there have been, you know, the, the, the 
20 lakh crores that has been uh, promised to other sec sectors. There's been no mention of civil society in that, in those, in those packages that have been announced. And other countries have spent up to 0 0.02, 0 0.03% of GDP, including countries like China. You know, I, you would not normally list China as a country that is extremely supportive of civil society, but they've actually helped civil society protect jobs through this crisis and increase tax exemptions for philanthropy. Is that something that government could be looking at if we're going to actually require civil society to step up uh, to this role that you're envisaging for them? So Ingrid, this is a very unprecedented crisis. I mean, just to give you the proportion of this crisis, you know, when the 2008 slowdown happened in the global economy, the global economy had actually declined by just minus 1%. But uh, this crisis, you've already had a crash of about over six point, negative growth of about 6.5%. The global wealth has eroded by over $16 trillion. You know, that's the extent of uh, destruction of global wealth across. And, you know, economies are struggling. Uh, across the world, you know, they're monetizing, they're doing several things. And uh, in India, we've had our own challenges. You know, the government revenues have slowed down. The government's challenge is to ensure that there is a demand. The government's challenge is to ensure that there's a, migrant workers have gone back, that there is a, uh, you know, adequate flow of resources for Mandrega, that uh, whole range of reforms on the agricultural sector takes place. So the government, you know, because the government firstly looks at what it can do for the people of the country, and therefore it is first focused on that. And I think, uh, you know, as we go along, let, let the revenues of the government improve. Uh, but definitely as a policy measure, we'll try and see what, how best we can do, what, what are the best policy measures we can take for the civil society uh, organizations? At least all the good civil societies must be so organizations must be supported fully, and we believe in working in close partnership with them. So, what best we can do? I, I do not know whether financing is the right way, but as a policy measure, what best we can do uh, to support them. Yeah, the, 100, the hundred crore capacity building fund that the social stock exchange has proposed would be a good start. Uh, I realize we're running out of time, um, and the, quest the questions are. Let me let me just say I think the, the the best thing about this conversation today is the degree of convergence. Uh, literally every speaker on this panel has seen or is seeing the future in very similar ways. Uh, we've clearly, I think the crisis has really helped us understand the benefits of collaboration, the value of civil society, the role that business can play uh, in going beyond doing business really to uh, being led by purpose rather than by profitability alone. Uh, and certainly some of the moves that Niti Aayog has already effected and is planning to effect uh, promise uh, a greater convergence. Uh, Amitabh Kant is already notorious for being one of the busiest men in government. I think we just added a few dozen things to his agenda for the next few months. Um, I What remains really, I think, is to... Ingrid, I may be busy, but I have all the time uh, for civil society organizations. We've noticed, we've noticed. Thank you. Um, the And your championing of civil society in the media, for example, I think has been invaluable in actually shifting that narrative. And we need to see more of that, including what you talked about in terms of showcasing uh, some of the innovation and the contribution uh, that you're seeing in the aspirational districts. I want to sort of leave us with one thought. It's very few words. I think what the crisis has made here is this. It's coexistence or no existence. We're standing on the cusp of what could be catastrophic disasters on development for the most marginalized, for women and girls, for the disabled, for sex workers, transgender communities, you name it, HIV positive communities are all on the brink of survival right now. And it will take very little to push them over the edge. But at the same time, we're looking at unprecedented, to use that word that's so overused, opportunity to make radical change happen. I think we're only limited by the capacity of our imagination at this point. So I just want to thank Nudge and thank all my fabulous panelists for a lovely discussion uh, and hand you back to Sriram. 
Thank you so much, Ingrid. Uh, and sincere thanks to all the panelists, Dr. Amitabh Khan, Amitabh Bihar, Vani. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time out for such an illuminating discussion. Uh, I think which was very, very calm and constructive. And hopefully, we will see this convergence translate into reality uh, in the medium long term. Again, thank you so much uh, for all your time.